Hello and welcome to the Finnovate Melbourne uh, Women in Data panel, where we're going to explore how we realise the true value of diversity to drive innovation. My name is Simone Clancy and I'm the Director of People Strategy at Yellowfin and the lead of our Women in Data program, which is focused on investing in programs that encourage more women to choose analytics and data science as a career. Before I introduce our panellists, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Greater Melbourne, the Boonwurrung, and pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. To our panellists, thank you and welcome to Sveta Friedman, Jana Malaziskova and Dr Linda McIver. Uh, Sveta Friedman is the Data Analytics and Data Science Director at carsales.com.au. She's a leader in the data science and BI space and she's recently been recognised as a top analytics leader by the Institute of Analytics Professionals of Australia. Dr Linda McIver has a PhD in computer science education and was nominated as one of the inaugural superstars of STEM in 2017. As head of the Australian Data Science Education Institute, Linda delivers innovative programs and resources to students and their teachers to support technology and data literacy. And last but not least, Jana Malaziskova, co-founder and CEO of Mayro and co-founder of She Loves Data. After a long, successful career in enterprise software and data analytics, Jana has embraced her inner entrepreneur and her passion for giving back. In two short years, She Loves Data has grown into an online community of more than 5,000 women in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. Welcome ladies. Uh, now to our topic of discussion, data and data related technologies are central to the innovation shaping our increasingly globalised societies. And there's growing recognition that diversity needs to be part of the equation to best reflect and serve those communities. A common focus of diversity initiatives are gender, uh, cultural and linguistic background and age, and increasingly disability and ability, socioeconomic background and access to opportunity, as well as cognitive style and skill sets. There are measurable benefits that come from diverse and inclusive workplaces. Individuals are demonstrably more committed and engaged and the ability to leverage a wide range of skills and insights has a positive impact on a company's ability to innovate and stay productive and profitable. It's been suggested that companies that invest in data and diversity outperform their competitors by as much as 35%. It's something we've recognised at Yellowfin. And while we're proud of our high numbers of culturally and linguistically diverse and female employees, it remains focused and it's a continued work in progress. So the development of our Women in Data program was a direct response to the challenges that we'd experienced in recruiting women into data related roles as a result of low participation in technology subjects from primary through to tertiary levels. We believe data education is an imperative to enable as wide a cross section as possible of people to become data literate and to develop the skills needed to become innovators in a rapidly changing landscape. Linda, if I can start with you, what's been your experience of the technology and data space? The biggest issue that we face in those spaces is that we have a very uniform personality type that gets attracted to technology and, and data, and it's largely because that's the kind of person who's always done it and so that's the kind of person who's attracted to it now and sees themselves reflected in that space the mm -hmm. gender lack of gender diversity is actually the low-hanging fruit that's the one that's easy to measure but we've actually got a much bigger lack of diversity and these industries are shaping our future but when you have the future being shaped by one very narrow set of of personality types and of people, one very homogeneous group of people, then they're not shaping a future that works for all of us. They're shaping a future inadvertently that works for them. Mm. And, and, you know, coming from an educational background and involved in education today, why do you think some traditional approaches to teaching and learning um, are not engaging and, and retaining? And as we talk about the low hanging fruit, young women, but I think you also talk about, you know, obviously young men and the lack of diversity um, in those subjects. There's a bit of a perfect storm. There's the, the constant issue that we don't have teachers who have the skills. And so you have teachers who are afraid of the technology trying to teach the technology. And that, of course, communicates itself to the kids. But you also have the issue that we're often trying to teach technology as a matter of fun. It's, it's toys, it's robots, it's drawing pretty pictures with code. 
and the kids don't see the point they don't see the relevance and they don't see it as something that that they really want to do but when you start teaching them from a data science perspective and you give them real problems to solve and say here are the skills that you need here are the tools that you need to solve real problems then they see the point of it and they see the the value of technology skills and the, the the potential that it gives them to change the world. And I think that's, that sounds like some of the, those programs that you're developing, that, that's really generating that excitement, isn't it, for, for students and, and engaging them, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so, you know, given we are in an era of rapid technological change and, and many traditional jobs and industries in decline, what do you think the role of government is in promoting data literacy and technology education as a driver for future innovation? Well, the government's done some um, some powerful things in terms of putting data and technology into the curriculum, but what we're still lacking is support for teachers to skill up in these areas because we're not going to get people with data science skills flooding into education. You can earn a lot more and work a lot less hard in almost any other industry. Um, so we need to support teachers to skill up, and that means time, and time means money. Mm. And I suppose that's a, a core focus of the Australian Data Science Education Institute, isn't it? Is giving teachers those skills and, and resources to be able to, to, to deliver those programs. That's right. It's training the teachers, uh, giving them the resources and also creating the communities that they have other teachers to talk to and, and fall back on when things get difficult. They can, they can talk to other people and find out how they do it. Fantastic. And we'll, yeah, we'll certainly return to that theme of, of community a bit later on in, in the discussion. Um, Sveta, I'm interested, you've had a really interesting education and, and, and background. Um, how's that supported you in becoming a leader in, in uh, data and innovation through your career? I think that um, education is, uh, regardless of what profession you are, is a must to have because it gives you that knowledge. And I think I'm kind of very lucky because my Knowledge is actually started in high school. Um, I always was good at math, but I didn't really realize then that this is a profession that I wanted to take further. I think I've not been ever encouraged as well, um, but I think the main uh, probably switch was for me um, coming from Israeli background, actually had to go to army. And, and that's where it's probably a realization happened when you do a lot of tests. They're saying, oh, you actually can do that. You're really good at math. Mm -hmm. And that's where I like, realized I can actually use what I know to my own advantage. Um, and I think that shaped me to actually to take my career and study statistics, mathematics, and know that this is a career I want to go with. Um, without, I believe, without like hard foundations, it's always hard to, to be a leader. Um, I think that you need to know um, your profession well enough, then you can actually provide um, that innovation and create additional um, optimization opportunities and innovation in, in this field only by actually knowing um, the basics as well. And I usually start by telling my team as well, um, tell me what you know and tell mm -hmm. me what you don't mm -hmm. know. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can actually focus on that because that's actually the base of your career is actually known sometimes some, some of the basic stuff. Mm. But also it sounds like you're a pretty supportive leader to them by giving them um, opportunities, I, I'm sure, to, to uh, fill in the blanks and develop those skills that they don't have. Definitely. And I think um, it comes on understanding. Sometimes um, when you start in your career, it's very hard for you to actually to know what, what you want to know and what you need to know for your career. Mm -hmm. And ability to actually guide and uh, provide that this is, you know, the must for you to know in order for you to use it for real problems. Because mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. there is a difference between theoretical, but then there is the crunch numbers as when it comes to real problem in companies. That's where yes. you actually need to know what it's to put into it. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, so I can see, ladies, I mean, it's been a bit of a theme. You've all um, been had the benefit, I guess, of, of a strong kind of technology, technological foundation uh, in your education. And you've obviously um, had opportunities through your, through, um, your professional experiences to, to develop further. Um, but Yana, I know you're a passionate supporter um, of women who want to lean in to a, a career in data. Often they're in mid-career or even late career, I've noticed. Um, and support the principle that's you know never too late to learn, and also that um, 
I suppose, uh, you know, finances shouldn't be a barrier as well. So I'd love you to highlight some of the successes of, of She Loves Data and also something that I've noticed in, in our involvement is how that demographic has actually shifted from younger women uh, to women, as I said, mid to, to late career. Well, basically, you know, I've been in a, a tech and data industry for the last 20 plus years. And uh, obviously, as we mentioned in the beginning, you know, there is a lack of diversity. And uh, today as well, with the, such a rapid development of technology, we need more data professionals and companies are really struggling to find the talent on the market. And uh, when you look at the percentage, usually you have like 80% of men and 20% of women, plus minus. Um, so when we, um, around two, three years ago, um, looked around us and we said, you know, we better kind of start to, you know, walk the talk and do mm -hmm. something about it rather than complaining. And we've put together um, a free educational um, workshops for women to encourage them to learn about technology because um, if you don't have a technical background or mathematician, you know, you're not mathematician or you are not, um, you know, someone who kind of has an interest in technology, you usually feel that maybe I should step back and let other people talk about this um, topic. But um, today, everyone is working with technology and data. So we mm -hmm. felt like we need to encourage women that maybe are in the middle of their career and they had traditional education, mm -hmm. uh, which was lacking, um, you know, this technology background, this okay. kind of data and digital literacy and help them to upskill themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and just to have basically discussions around data and tech, because today those discussions are part of any business discussions. So we wanted to give them a possibility to build up um, basics, um, understandings of uh, technology and data. And uh, we were really surprised how many women uh, were interested in this topic and they didn't want it to stop with just introduction to data and technology. Um, so we work with you, Yellowfin, uh, on subjects like data visualization, data storytelling. And uh, there are many women from various careers, industries coming and joining us. And today our online community is 16,000 people in nine, 10 countries. And oh, wow. I didn't have the figures right, Jana, this yeah, yeah. Right since I introduced you. <laughs> it's, it's completely fine because, you know, it's evolving and every day we have a new workshop somewhere else and there are more women joining us and the community is growing. And um, I think what we as well found out, it's not, you know, only about the hard skills, but it's as well about finding individuals that think um, similarly like you, if you want to learn something, it's good to be in a group of people who are interested in a similar topics. And sometimes you don't know where to start. So She Loves Data is basically such a platform to help everyone to come in and start and learn something new. And then within the large community, what is often happening, we see that there are sub communities being built for women, um, you know, coding online and then they are meeting together and discussing you know what they've learned so it's a amazing movement uh, which uh, to be honest we had no idea it's going to grow like this when we started in singapore in 2016 uh, and um, and it seems like that the issue is the same everywhere that women want to upskill themselves and uh, it's hard to start somewhere if you are in the middle of your career and often we see women they want to change careers and they want to become data analysts or business analysts and um, as you rightly said linda you know it's hard to start where do you actually start with this so we give them a possibility to learn a little bit more and find their directions so that's what is happening yeah it, it's a fantastic success story it's yeah it's it's so exciting to hear um so linda you also touched on the importance of you know um yana was talking about the the, the building of communities how that's really vital for your um, for, for the teachers who, you know, are perhaps lacking resources and, and that's where they can be supported is, is through those communities. So that, that's a really key part of, of um, you know, helping individuals break into the data space to, to supporting those that are, are trying to teach these skills to, to young people. I, I wonder if we need to actually connect She Loves Data with the teachers and maybe this is, maybe this is a way we can help build the community because we know Wouldn't from the research that if you give the teachers something new, new to try, when it goes belly up, which it will 
you know, at some point when you're trying something new, something goes wrong. If they don't have someone right there to talk to, to, to kind of get them through that difficult bit, they'll retreat back to where it's safe. And I think for the most reason, for, for the most part, that's because they just don't have time. Mm. You know, they're, they're so pushed for time. The workload is so yeah. crazy that if, it, if something new doesn't work, they're going to ditch it and go back to what they know does work. So that sense of community and that having someone there to support them at the at the instant is is crucial. Yeah, I think we often organize like train the trainer um, programs because we have many people who are active in you know data analytics, data science, and they have the ambition that they want to you know teach others and get other people involved, and and that's great because we all need that. Um, and, and, you know, this could be actually a good uh, combination to talk actually to the teachers. We work in Singapore with some universities. We started recently and it's been incredible success. It's um, It gives a boost to, you know, both the, um, you know, educational kind of community and then, you know, the professionals who are coming in. So, yeah, let's That's talk. Fantastic. Yeah, we should. Love it. Love it. <laughs> So, Yana, we, we had some interesting discussions last week about um, how you believe employers have to get a bit more um, creative and uh, courageous in their recruitment approach because obviously that's sort of the next step for people once they've got these these skills uh, to hopefully go out and, and you know, utilise them in, in a work environment. So can you tell me a little bit more about how you recruit for both Myro and, and, and She Loves Data? Well, um, we were discussing basically how um, diversity is important for innovation and it's important to have a, obviously, you know, a diverse group of people working with specifically data. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and I mentioned that in our startup, Meiro, in Singapore, our data analyst team is only 100% female. And, uh, and the people often ask me, you know, how do you do this? And I say like, well, it's so easy because I hire from She Loves Data community because there are so many women who come from such a different background and different industries and they want to break into a data field and it's very difficult for them because um, what, what, what we hear from the community is very difficult to actually get the first data job if you don't have, um, you know, tech background, you know, if you don't have a, a computer science education and people often today study online, they are incredibly skilled, you know, their GitHubs are amazing. And still, when they go to some traditional interviews, they are not getting the jobs. So mm -hmm. what uh, I was sharing uh, with you uh, was that, you know, we kind of changed our um, hiring process. What we do, we look at, you know, we give people some practical tasks to solve and it doesn't matter if they s solve them or not, but we want to see the logical approach to the problem solving itself. And then we believe the hard skills you can actually learn. And if you have some basic knowledge, um, you know, of SQL or Python and you want to learn more, we give these women often a chance, you know, through let's say a junior position for some specific time and then we see how they evolve and uh, this has been working incredibly well um, very good example is one of our data analysts she started with us in august last year on an internship position she was coming from a finance industry and loved math uh, but couldn't get a data analyst job so we said okay show us what you what you can do and today she's a senior data engineer she loves doing, you know, ETL. She loves working with the data on a more um, engineering kind of um, level. And uh, it's amazing to see, you know, someone growing in 16 months and doing such an incredible job. So it's about changing the hiring process um, in a way that you look at the person not based on some, you know, those are the set skills this person has to have. And mm. if it's not there, we will not hire this person. It's mm -hmm. about basically looking as well at the essential skills, you know, and uh, what is fantastic with uh, women that are changing their careers into tech and data is that they are incredibly passionate about that. If they really go after and you give them a chance, you get incredibly skilled people who are willing to learn, they learn fast and they are loyal as well to the companies. So 
you know what I feel and what 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 from my own experience I'm telling a large brands that are coming to us and and we cooperate with with many big organizations mm -hmm. which she loves data and we tell them you know look this is a community full of women we have 36 percent of women in in the community that want to change job into data so mm -hmm. give them a chance change the hiring process mm -hmm. and then you will have incredibly diverse and loyal workforce so, mm -hmm. so it's the hiring process, and then we as well worked. Uh, I talked about that. It's not only to hire them, but as well to retain them, and that's yes. another discussion. Yes, <laughs> and I will actually touch on that. Uh, I want to hear from um, Sveta actually about how, because I think your teams are pretty diverse at Car Sales. Like how you've gone about building building those teams. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely, <laughs> I, I do consider my team very diverse, um, and I think uh, part of I would actually say that. Very similar to Jan's approach, I actually don't really look into what degree or, you know, don't have like hard um, criteria about who I'm hiring. Like it's not like, oh, I know someone from this university or having mathematical degree or computer science. I usually start with by giving a person a task to do and see how the person will approach and solve the problem. So that's very important to me because I I look to understand um, the way a person is trying to solve the problem, how they would approach it, and definitely will not try to solve the same way as me. So the other thing that I think car sales and um, is actually helped me to realize is bias because things that we all have some some way of bias in us and realizing and be aware of bit of awareness of what is your bias is making sure that you, when you're hiring, and, and that's kind of thing that I usually try to make sure every time I hire someone, actually think about making sure that I, I understand my biasness, so I don't use that. So that's very important. And third thing in, I think in the teams for me is important is openness, uh, openness mm -hmm. to to the team, openness mm -hmm. uh, and being always honest, and celebrating that you are different. Because I think that by actually celebrating that, it actually is um, understanding that because we are so different, we can actually, and things so different, we can find the best solutions. Um, and I think that is important because sometimes people say to me, are you trying to hire someone who thinks the way you think? And I usually say, no, the opposite. I actually want to hire people near me that actually think very different to me because I already have an opinion and a lot of times <laughs> I want to see someone else who have a different opinion to me and who will actually challenge me as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, that's really where the, the magic happens, isn't it? The innovation where you, you've got all those yeah, different points of view coming together. Yeah, so that probably is what helps me to, to get very diverse team and I'm very proud of seeing that in car sales we actually do have very diverse uh, teams in in a different field, not just in the data, but also in other teams as well. Mm, fantastic, um, Yanni. You touched on a point. I'm going to sort of lead into that now. I think it's it's not enough to actually build these diverse teams, and I think Sveti, you kind of touched on them as well. You've really got to have an inclusive culture, and those diverse people, I suppose, have to feel like they can bring their whole selves to work, and it's it's somewhere that they're really comfortable to be, and that also they're supported to really reach their full potential, so they they've got a path to grow uh, within the organisation. So, um, you know, they really need to feel safe and comfortable being themselves. Um, it's it's really been key to our success here at Yellowfin as well. Actually, is is really harnessing all those different skills, abilities, perspectives. Um, and, and also, it's, it's it's really you talked about um, Svetlana that you you were saying that um, you know there had to be honesty and openness and, and trust and things like that. And I think that's you know that's a key component of it as well. That there has to be uh, real mutual respect underpinning all those relationships. And and, and that's where yeah, diverse mindsets can really be supported and thrive. Um, so is there is there anything else for it in terms of like a you know an inclusive organisation? What do, what does that look like for you? I mean, you've touched on on some of the the themes I think in talking about how you you build your diverse culture. I think I'm, I'm coming back to the hiring because it's all about basically people and team and um, and and as you rightly mentioned, it's about being honest and open and transparent and to talk about those. Um, 
values right away when we are hiring people mm -hmm. and we are as well very uh, distributed organizations so we have people in so many locations and they work in virtual teams so people have to rely on each other and mm -hmm. um, um, you know um, I, I think the the hiring usually what we do we do not have a, we do have a job descriptions but we look at people and then we tend to adjust the positions based on who they are and uh, okay. we try to find out what they do best and what they like to do because we know that if you like to do something you will have the best results oh, possible yeah. so we yeah. usually adjust the, the the job positions and we for example hired one data analyst um, she actually had a, a, a project management background and accounting background and she was passionate about uh, building dashboards so we said okay let's create and then we looked at her in the probation period and she was amazing so we said okay so why don't we actually create position which is called a now um, a technical project manager and it was someone who was running the projects but as well helping the clients with building the dashboards because she understood their business needs and mm -hmm. uh, she was able to sit down with them and you know in a very effective way define you know those are the kpis the business needs to look at and she was building dashboards for them and it was something we didn't kind of see uh when we were hiring her but um i think it's 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 very good to have um kind of free um, um organizational structure that you are able to adapt the jobs to the best abilities people can bring to the table and it, it it really helps again to drive the innovation because you can as an organizations and we are now small um, startup in um, in customer data um, space and uh, we are kind of looking at things that are moving and changing all the time in our space you know there are new rules new legal restrictions on how to use data gdpr pdpa and all this and and we need to adapt and then we look at our team that you know we we keep it flexible in terms of definitions of the roles and mm -hmm. it really helps us to keep on top of the you know um innovation game as well fantastic now um Sveta, i know that you're a mentor um so you know can you tell us a bit about that and and how you're helping your mentees uh to succeed and and, and thrive to be honest, it's uh, very hard to be for me. It's very hard to be a mentor, um, but I do believe that usually when people come into me, they ask me for advice, um, and um, the relationship starts with being honest um, and understanding what the goals are. So usually by us developing that relationship is uh, making sure that I can then help. Mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. honesty is kind of important because as a mentor you want to give the best advice but in order to give the best advice sometimes you need to understand what's um what's the problem you're trying to solve and mm -hmm. um not being biased or having one opinion is important for you to actually analyze the situations that you can actually help the person to achieve the right goals mm -hmm. um so i usually have this framework where we we, we developed that goals framework and we discussed about what we would like to achieve in one, three, and six, and 12 months. Um, and we talk about some some kind of um, journeys and what's, you know, what's the outcomes we want to see and how we think that we're going to achieve them. Sometimes uh, I'm also a mentor, but just someone who actually saying, so they can you tell me how to develop my career and uh, and a lot of them just come sometimes with, uh, you know, with a message. Can you just tell me how to progress in my career and what I need to do? And it's very mm -hmm. hard to say such if you don't really know the person. And so the first mm -hmm. question that I usually ask is, what do you want to be doing? Because um, sometimes um, in order to develop a career, you need to know what your passion is. And Yana touched a lot of times on, on, on the cases if you understand where you could add, then the career will go and it mm -hmm. will drive you to the right goals. Mm -hmm. If you are just trying to, to say, I just wanted to be a leader, but I don't actually enjoy to do the data analysis, mm -hmm. I don't actually like the data, then it's very hard to be a leader in the data. So 
first is actually establishing what you're actually good at and what your passion is. And then I think a lot of outcomes is, as, uh, as me giving an advice is actually it's very easy because if you're good at something, you can definitely achieve it easily. Linda, have you, have you had some mentors in your career? What's been the, the roles of mentors in, in your career or, or supporters that have helped uh, you get where you need to be? Mentors have been crucial. Um, I've, I've found that just to, you know, there's always, regardless of what you're doing, there's always hard days. And when you run a startup and a charity like I do, then there are some really hard days and you really need people around at that point to, to um, sometimes to lift you up and <laughs> pat you on the back and sometimes to wield what I call a frying pan of enlightenment. Give you a thump and go, <laughs> you know, you get your head in the game, you know, you sort yourself out. And um, I, I wouldn't be where I am if I hadn't had, you know, a whole collection of people like that who are prepared to, like Sveta said, be honest with me and, you know, wield the frying pan when necessary. But also, you know, just just support me and and tell me when I'm doing good things that you know some days you can't see. Mm. Um, look, uh, we're we're nearing a, a close. There's one topic I do sort of want to touch on. We, we've you know now talked about how we we train, um, how we recruit and we retain diversity to drive innovation in organisations. Um, as the use of AI becomes more prevalent, there's, it's a topic that, uh, you know, a topic that causes anxiety for a lot of people, particularly people that aren't working in the space like us, is um, the notion of data bias. And Linda, I want to know uh, what your thoughts are, how we actually, you know, address this, this issue. Look, that's one of the crucial reasons that I'm actually training kids to be data literate and, and, and data science skilled because we are at a point now where we can't even have the conversation as a society because people don't know enough about what's happening and what the potential is um, for both for benefit but also for quite <laughs> serious catastrophe. And we need to be, we need all to be skilled enough that we can have that conversation and go, well, look, this is okay, but this over here, that's that's going too far or this is not right. We can't have that conversation until we're all skilled enough to know what's going on. Mm. Thank you. Jan, did you have any thoughts on the topic? Look, we, we're talking with our clients about customer data on a daily basis and, and people get freaked out because they don't understand what is happening with their data. And, and I so agree with Linda, data literacy and digital literacy is so important uh, because people then understand what is happening kind of behind the scene there. Mm. You know, I'm, I've been here in Europe now for three weeks and I've heard so many times people told me, oh, this is like a big brother is watching you. But when you ask people about the details, what they mean, they don't know how it yeah. actually works. Mm. They just have a bad feeling about that. Mm. Mm. And, uh, it is a feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so with the AI and, and even advanced technology, it doesn't have to be artificial intelligence, you know. Mm. I think people have to understand, you know, what is happening with their data when they go search something, you know, online. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be this, uh, you know, data science uh, topic. Uh, so we need to start there. And then people will have a better understanding how artificial intelligence is uh, working and what it actually means. And uh, they will understand that, uh, you know, the principles are important. Um, it's important to have a diverse groups. Uh, it's important there is a talk about a different uh, legislative changes around mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. So there will be basically some basic rules about that, how to build the models. So the models are fair. And, you know, those are the discussions we need to have. And I think we cannot have that broad enough. So that's why, you know, it's uh, important to just drive the conversation about what the data is and what is happening, you know, when we use our computers and our mobile phones on a daily basis. Mm. So all, I think, pretty clear arguments uh, for, for diversity in, in the Absolutely. space. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think, unfortunately, we, we are just about out of time. Uh, Jana, Linda and Sveta, thank you for your time and insights. It's been a really thought-provoking session and it's one I hope will prompt a bit of further thinking and discussion about how we encourage and support diversity as a driver for innovation. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>